Jug-shaped masonry. It's a beautiful piece of art, and they're known to nest on eaves and under bridges. And they've initially increased in the early 1800s with farming and whatnot. Um, back when the country was relatively new, and nobody used any paint on their barns. Slide, please. I find cliff swallows quite sociable and very cute. I mean, have a look right here. During times when food is hard to find, um, particularly over in places like Nebraska where there's a much larger population of them, they actually have little messages for each other and they send out a sweet call to alert the others where the food is if they're having a particularly hard time trying to find it. All right, well, they forage as a loose unit, and I've seen that down in um, Simon's Rock. They certainly do. It's really wonderful to behold. Suddenly you think it's a big flock, and then they just spread out as far as the eye can see. And then suddenly, from out of nowhere, they all kind of congeal together. It's, it's, it's very awesome. Ah, slide, please. Both sexes help with the nest building. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> nest construction is accomplished in a couple of weeks, give or take, um, for you know bad weather, no mud, hard time finding mud, whatever the case may be. Uh, slide, please. And here's our one-on-one -on -one nest construction with cliff swallows. Step one: gather up a mouthful of mud. Slide, please. Step two, fashion it into little pillows. This. That is some really interesting work. Slide, please. Step three, they allow it to dry, like so. Slide, please. And then, to make the nest complete, they go get soft and cushy material, such as feathers and grass. Slide, please. And after about a thousand trips, give or take, for the completion of the nest, this is what you have for a completed cliff swallow nest. Slide, please. Who doesn't love aerial insectivores? Okay, I'm just showing off because it looks cool seeing them fly. Slide, please. Okay, well, aerial insectivores happen to be birds who catch flying insects while they themselves are in flight. And you can see the wood bulb right there and the little young tree swallow going to gobble it up. Isn't that fun? Slide, please. And we have two types of aerial insectivores. We have hawkers and saviors. And some aerial insectivores, like the swallows, swifts, and nightjars, hawk for their insects. They fly around basically with their mouth open and just shove them in. These guys here are saviors. And what they do, it's more or less like an ambush hunter. They kind of perch on a branch or whatever, and a flying insect goes by, they jump off, snaggle it up, and then go back to the branch. Slide, please. <sighs> What's so great about aerial insectivores, anyway? We are glad you asked, really. Slide, please. Okay, let's talk about it. For example, the adult tree swallow, who nests in tree cavities, but as you can see here, uses nest boxes, can catch up to 2,000 flying insects a day, and an additional 3,000 if they happen to have a few chips. Slide, please. And the barn swallow. Well, somebody counted that as about 60 insects per hour. Can you imagine counting these things out in the field? Wow. I'm very impressed with the person who actually did that. Slide, please. And we have another relative. This is the purple marker. And some folks did a uh, 
energetics model based on million individuals. They found that they could eat collectively 412 billion insects in a 45-day nesting period. Um, it's around, uh, what is it, about 40,000 insects per bird per 45-day nesting. It's, it's impressive. Slide, please. Okay, and this is our summary. Purple Martin, 915.56, give or take per day. Maybe more if they're extra hungry. 2,000 for the tree swallow, 720 for the barn swallow. So, if you average that out to 12, 12, 85 insects collectively, with a median of 915.56, we can safely assume that a cliff swallow would probably eat about 1,000 insects a day. Slide, please. All right, well, things are not all ducky. The number of cliff swallows nesting in the northeastern sector of the U.S. has been slowly decreasing since the Industrial Revolution, basically, and really is taking a nosedive probably since the mid to late 1990s. Uh, part of the issue is the imported house sparrow, which pretty much uh, took over the entire planet. Um, how can you the cliff swallows? They have earlier beaks. That means they have a better weapon so that when someone's fighting over a nest, you got a thin snow shovel of a bill or you have a post hole digger. Now, if you're going to try to conk on somebody, that post hole digger is going to do a lot more damage. And as northeastern farmlands disappear, some of it grows in, some of it gets urbanized, it's less than ideal for cliff swallow habitat. Um, and to add to that, we have modern paints. And when people paint their barns with this stuff, the sun, you know, the, uh, the nesting material does not stick to the paint. They fall off. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's not good. And we can't leave out pesticides or insecticides. Um, that's a food supply issue. And if you're, you know, I mean, like, you could have the greatest habitat in the world, but if they don't have food, are you going to have them? No. Slide, please. <coughs> and this is a 10-year-old uh, um, count that uh, was done up in Canada. And if you look right here, uh, particularly the collective decline, the steepest one, about better than 60% by now, because this is 10 years old, is the aerial insectivores. Big, big trouble. Slide, please. And, well, this is the uh, breeding bird atlases from 1975 to 79, 2007 to 2011. Keeping in mind, it's 2022 now. Who knows what this really looks like now? Yeah, these are gone. <laughs> contracted, Linda and I keep track of what's going on with swallows in the state. And we need a new map. Just to interject. Yes, th thank you so much because I didn't really know what exactly existed, but since it's no longer 2011, um, I couldn't really speak to this over here because I haven't been here checking any of it out. Slide, please. And this is the trend. Little red areas are where they're in decline. The blue areas are when they're are in the increase. And then over here, the USGS map of the nesting distribution. Now keep in mind, I accessed this back in 2019. Again, things have changed. Slide, please. <coughs> so. What it means in a 49-year period, wow. Cliff swallow populations in the areas highlighted in red have 
easily by now been cut in half. And I just have like a little mind bending exercise that you can look at. And I started thinking to myself, I said, okay, so if we lost 50% of bird species between the Industrial Revolution and 1966, and between 66 and 2015, we lost another, another 73.5. What percentage of pre-industrial bird populations are left? That's a scary number right there. 1325? Let us hope my math is totally off. Because if it isn't, that's a real scary number. Slide, please. And this brings up a glimmer of hope that I'm going to have Mara share with you because the woman is an artist. Brilliant. She is at one with the cliff squad. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a very nice compliment. Linda is also at one with the Cliff Swallow in a different way. We compliment each other, and it's been a joy to have her pop on my project. I started looking at Cliff Swallows back almost 30 years ago, and um, I still like them. <laughs> yeah, so when I first got involved with Cliff Swallows, it was just sort of casual observation that led me. I was a birder. Um, I had been more interested in seabirds, but I was back here in Western Mass and noticing that all the cliff swallow colonies I found were failures, either because, like, the, the reasons that Linda had spelled out, house sparrows were the number one issue, and then the number two issue were nests falling from bees. And to me, those are kind of simple. Those are straightforward problems. I mean, some birds... We don't know why they're disappearing, and um, there's very complex reasons, and it's hard to find their nest. But cliff swallows were right in front of me, and I thought, let's do, can we address these issues? If we can directly address these issues that we see in front of us, can these breeding colonies increase? So, next slide. Oh, so we're going to grow. So, grow is one of our success stories. I was going to talk about, I make artificial nests for cliff swallows, and I also control. Bro, we're going to talk about, um, I don't know, are you, any of you familiar with Bro Mass? Okay. So, in the middle of Bro is the town hall, and there were originally eight pairs of cliff swallows on that building in 2015. Um, and the mud there is very sandy. Um, and somehow, some excited birders in town got permission from the people at town hall for us to put up artificial nests. One great thing about row is that there aren't any house sparrows there. So I'm finding that the ideal spots for these cliff swallow rehabilitation projects are sites where there are no house sparrows present, which is hard to find because they tend to, you tend to find them in agricultural areas. But here we have in row a spot where it's perfect habitat, it's not a farm, there are no house sparrows. So what we did is over time, since 2018, we installed artificial nests. So these nests, I brought one. That's a barn swallow. Oh, barn swallow. Oops. Yeah. I also deal with barn swallows if anybody's excited about those. So this is an artificial cliff swallow nest. Um, it's basically, uh, it's made from fire. It's, it's ceramic that you use to make dishes. It's hand-built and fire, so it's like durable. It won't degrade in water, but it's breathable. And I sound like I'm doing an ad for <laughs> I'd like to sell you this home. And it's really not hard to do because they are very attracted to old nests. And it's like, just like us, if they see a house, if there's a completed house, you have to remember these birds might up, they winter in South America, in, um, in Argentina, Paraguay, pretty far down. So when they get here, they're on tight energy budget, and if they see an old nest, they're going to eat it. So you can pass that around if you want. Um, so they're also, another thing to know about their life history is they're probably one of the most social of the swallows in the swallow martin family, which there are about 75 species worldwide. So 
So they are almost like bees, um, not quite, but in terms of think about their wanting to be together. And all of, they even nest kind of synchronously, so you'll see the colony is almost doing everything in the unison. So they're collecting mud together, and they're building their nests at the same time. It's a little more variable in, in some colonies that are less successful, because they'll try to nest if they fail. But generally, you know, row, this colony at Row was, everybody was pretty much, I'd say 80, 95% of the colony was at the same place, you know, in their nesting cycle at the same time. So this colony has doubled every year. So this, we went from eight pairs, well, now we might not be wrong, it might not be eight pairs every year. Let's suffice to say that this year, we had over 40 pairs there nesting. Um, one other thing, though, Natural systems are always way more complicated than you think. You know, we've been here for a blink of an eye, and we think we understand things, and we don't understand anything. That's my, what I find out, the more I dig into this natural history stuff, the more confused I am. One other thing that happens in the larger colonies is crisp swallows have a parasite that is specific to them called a swallow bug, it's like a bed bug. And when these build up in colonies, they will not nest. They'll abandon the colony and move No, bugs are important. Okay. Um, but with these, this contraction of their uh, numbers of colonies in the state, there's really nowhere for them to go. Birds like the swallows and barn swallows, which you might be more familiar with, that rely on human made structures, are totally at the mercy of our being willing to let them be there. And not everybody thinks like you and I. So um, there's nowhere for this colony to go, and we are doing hardcore intervention. So few colonies left in the state. So every year we take down the nets and we wash them and we prevent that issue of the swallows. That's one other thing. Love men. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing that's great about this colony is that it's in a beautiful spot and the town cop protects it. He loves the colony. And he just won't let anybody say anything bad about it, let alone touch it. So next slide. So here you go. This is Row. These are Linda's wonderful photos the entire show, basically. Um, the young birds are that oh from here that bird was this brown. Is one, yeah, was, yeah, the young birds are brown. Mm -hmm. Um the, when they fledge, they don't look like their parents. Um, they've got kind of speckly faces. You can see here this is the part of the nest I made and then they add. They always fix the doorway. So okay. Next slide. So then we also have a couple of uh, in Berkshire County, we know of two colonies that are under fruiting, so they're being populated. We've got to get under there. And so we found a rock climber, and next slide. And here he is. And what we did is, cliff <laughs> swallows generally seem to want a roof over their head, so we, I made a little roof, and actually that was enough. It's sort of like an eave. So they're hanging midair. Is there a picture of the roof? Yeah. I think they're as well. Yeah. So here are some nice photos. Again, are these Linda's or mm -hmm. yeah. You can see where I I this is the, the ceramic part that they added. And the great thing about these, of course, is they don't fall. And at these bridge sites, we also don't compress those. So they're important. Um, but again, natural systems are complicated and we have no idea, but at one of our sites, no swallows showed up. Even though, and you know, but we don't know. Maybe there weren't enough insects to uh, protect them from site degradation. Who knows? Or they're so colonial that they'll tend to follow. You know, we, if one bird gets the idea and wants to nest a mile away, they might all follow, and we might not find it. You know, that's another thing. Next slide. So there it is. That's. Um, I'll share the secret. That's New Lenox Road. Not far from here. What is it? Okay, dear. yeah, yeah. So um, that's where they are, and they're doing well. Of course, now I want to get those nets down too, and then I'm like, you might be able to let go of the net. We might need that climb again, you know? That was a lot of work, so we're, we've got to figure out how to deal with that because I don't like to use chemicals because for all the reasons we've mentioned. So that's 2020, next semester season. This season we had 18 pairs under that bridge, uh, all 12. Yeah, all 12 
more potatoes, and then there was more, and then there was more, and then there was um, a couple second lessons. Yeah, so they don't have second grades on my shelves, but they will be on the next shelves. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So this is my next invention, which this is brilliant. <laughs> well, no, it's really crazy, but um, I think it's great. So sometimes, you know, I put up artificial nests at one roof column. So they were falling, so I just thought, well, I'll just take some water And I don't like it as much as, I mean, I can see them kind of, the surfaces of the eggs are kind of on the side of the thing. But the, the further along their chicks are, the more energy they're producing, the more they're breaking the eggs and entering all those places. So they all use them, but I was like, we should get some, like, maybe do some two-printed nest forms, like the colors of the nest mm -hmm. or And the nest will fall in it. So, um, you know, one thing you may be wondering is like, why are these all doing that? Well, it's natural. The nest will fall in it. They're doing well in other areas. What's the issue? And I think at this point, it's true that human changes can be a thing that obstructed has increased the population of clip squirrels. Historically, it did. But what's happening now is that a lot of Previously used habitat is now empty. So there's all those factors that are challenging them, like the pesticide use, probably. You know, climate change is huge. Who knows what this drought is doing to insect populations? And then on their migration, there's the hurricanes that we have now. So we're sort of like, we're in enough of a depression that we can't really help them with the food. It's kind of worn off uh, because it's pretty much really just. Even if you know, if you go out west and come towards the south, you'll see them hunt thousands of pelicans. Um, so that, yeah, that's a little panic. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. They were like, what? You know, but they did eventually go in. So that's good. I like how they're so adaptable. <laughs> yeah. I watched, though, and I'm like, is it going to go in? Am I going to have to take this thing down? So, yeah. I started dipping them in mud. That helped. The oh, yeah. yeah. My dad's old t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's and so, also some of the things we've attempted to. Um, yeah, so the so Berkshire Community good. College, which this is just down the road here. There's historically been uh, lots of clips of in here. Good sized colony. It's contracted mainly due to house sparrows, but we also like to. Um, we also just wanted to. There were it was low enough numbers. Follows from my casual observation, and then this are attracted to mud. So, if you want to capture their attention, you, you, you know, a lot of people say, I want clip swallows, they'll be fine. I have a brook down on the back. But if you make a big, sticky mud puddle and put it in front of the barn, they're more likely to take notice. Just like it was, you know, in farming days in your heyday in New England. So, this is just our creation. Linda has amazing photos, we call it mud can, of things that came to the cliff swallows and other birds and that came to that pot. So, so these are the enhancements we do. Creating mud sources, installing artificial nests, and getting rid of house sparrows, which is easier said than done. Um, so this is kind of interesting. It just shows you basically when house sparrows are at the rate of the, the, the breeding success is generally cut in half, which goes along with other studies that have been done on cliff swallows and, and um, house parrots. So, I mean, they have really good success when they're at, um, you know, when they're breeding without house sparrows, and especially if they have artificial nests. And they do pretty poorly when there are house sparrows present, because house sparrows are, they won't just take over one nest. Mind you, they're non native to so they don't take over one nest, they'll claim one nest, which would be fine. I think we'd be okay with that. But they defend like a broad zone of nests around their nest. And that just, it just takes a huge chunk out of the cliff swallow population success. Okay. 
So, yeah, we, colonies are changing. This we, we did a really intensive inventory in 2020, and we're still doing it. Um, but some of these colonies, like there's a, what we call Shaker Mill, which is in West Stockbridge, Greenmeads, which is in Richmond. These were all colonies, Richmond Community College. They've pretty much petered out. Um, another colony in Hadley is pretty much almost gone. And this is House Barrows, because um, we've been doing everything we do at the successful site with the steps and so on. Um, so, how, getting rid of House Barrows again. Um, we do have, so this year we had a really good, in spite of House Barrows, Air Hill Farm, which is a big colony, a big farm with a big colony, one of the larger. Largest is in Cheshire. And we put up actually instead of the complete nest, we, we actually put up little ledges which kind of look like this. I don't have a photo, but it, they built onto it. Um, I don't know why I did that there. I think because it's been such a long term successful colony. I didn't think they needed the entire nest. It was kind of an experiment. But I put 46 of these up on the north side of the barn away from the house where the house sparrows were congregating and they seem to do okay. I don't know if that's why probably it was good that nests weren't falling. Um, and the biggest colony in the state is in Great Barrington. There are like a hundred pairs at Sunny's Rock College. That colony also has house sparrows and we did control house sparrows there but didn't eliminate them and that colony did better than it has in the past couple of years. Maybe house sparrows are well, one of the interesting things, um, to me anyways, um, particularly both at Air Hill and um, Simon's Rock, was there wasn't nearly as many house sparrows out and about yeah. um, than in previous years, you know, hence the more successful uh, yeah. reproduction rate. Um, yeah. And this suggests an answer. Both places have a nesting pair of kestrels. Um, that farm, oh, I can't even remember the name of the farm, I think it's called Lula's oh, Farm, or the how or the, uh, I love our lazy farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's where the, um, colony split off last year. Um, but there was a mess of house sparrows over there last year. There wasn't anything there. Um, I ran into the, uh, proprietor, her name is Mary, and, um, she told us that they had, nesting kestrels on the property. And that's less than a mile away from Simon's Rock. So maybe they were they were nesting and you know having with it. Which farm? Um Leela's I think it's Leela's Lila Lila is it a sheep farm? Yeah Lila it's a sheep farm. Yes, yes, yes it is. There are six bottles there. Yeah. Yeah I didn't I didn't see anything other than, you know, Flyovers, um, because Mary took us around um, the farm, and I didn't see any nesters, but there was signs of nesting. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so it wasn't a bad year, considering. I guess overall we lost quite a few small colonies, but our larger colonies were okay. We did pretty well, considering. Uh, <coughs> do you want to take over from here, or do you want? To are you feeling it? Yeah. Are you um, feeling it? Roll, man, roll. Well, we've gone over a lot of reasons for decline. Um, I think I think we're good on decline. I mean, climate change and pesticides are very complex. Have very complex effects. And like we've been saying, aerial insectivores as a group are declining. Not every bird in the group known as aerial insectivores is declining, but many are. Unfortunately, large percentage are. So something's going on with insects, but you know, studies studies give us clues. So, you know, some studies in Canada are showing that for cliff swallows and bark swallows and bang swallows, the same amounts of food are being brought, brought to chicks in visits, but the, the birds are in poorer, they're less, they weigh less when they're ready to flesh. So maybe the quality of insects is suppressed. Um, you know, there are things we just don't know. We have a lot of lot to learn. Why, how, and why they're being affected by climate change and pesticides. Habitat loss and house barriers are kind of obvious. But so, I think what Lynn and I want to do is try to hold. 
hold on to the lasting colonies in the state while we try to solve some of these larger issues. Um, I don't know if they'll be solved. Well, I'm alive, but me neither. <laughs> anyway, we can always try. <laughs> so, and we have noted that in the case of this well, this project well, is doing simple things that they're Okay, insecticide use, aka disrupting the food source, starving them out. That's the way you kind of want to think about this. Not so much as a mosquito. No, you want to think, think insects, think food. So, nobody really knows how much neonics are used. This is a distribution map. The last one they did of imidacloprid. And this was back in 2014. They can no longer monitor how much of it is actually being used because back then they were including the treated seeds. They don't do that anymore. Slide, please. Can I just interject? Sure. Neonicotinoids are a systemic pesticide and they're applied to the plant or to the seeds, but only 10% of it is taken up by the plant. So 90% goes into the ground and ends up in water. And cliff swallows feed on insects that hatch from water primarily. So it doesn't see, you know, it's not a direct thing. It's not like they're eating a poisonous seed. They are eating insects that are de the, that are being affected by an insecticide. Just wanted to throw that in there. Yes, please do. Because okay. it makes me think of, um, remember nicotine patches? Do they still sell those? Probably. And, now, how many of you have seen Thank You for Smoking when they kidnap the, the bureaucrat guy and they slap down a mess of nicotine patches on him and it got him so sick it threw him in the hospital and the doctor told him the next cigarette would kill him? That's kind of, that's neonics. Yeah. Slide, please. And this one is kind of scary to me. Um, this is the dual action insecticide that they use a synergist with, uh, hypermobile butoxide. And it's usually listed third on the ingredient of these things. And when an exterminator comes to your house and tells you, yeah, we're just using a, a small amount, what that basically means is they don't have to use large amounts of insecticides because this PBO here is a synergist, and that amplifies the effect of the other ingredients here. And these ones look like they're a neurotoxin of some sort, pyrethroids, scary. And PBO bumps it up. Slide, please. This one kind of made me nervous. This came from CDC because it had some, um, what I call misleading uh, phrases on the uh, little, uh, what do you call that, info, uh, infogram, whatever they call those things. Yeah. Yeah. And they go very small amounts. When a very small amount of insecticide is mentioned, you always want to associate that, okay, they're using a small amount, not to keep it safe, they're doing it because they also introduced a small amount of synergist which just bumps the uh, activity all the way up. Another one is it immediately kills flying mosquitoes on contact, as if mosquitoes are the only thing it's going to kill. It does. It would hit dragonflies, bees, whatever. Slide, please. And as many of you know, whatever we throw at them chemically. Insects are pretty creative in, in, you know, developing resistance. They do cuticular resistance. It's a lot like developing calluses, like say if you play the guitar or you touch hot things. Eventually, first it burns you, but if you do it enough times, you develop cuticular resistance in an insect. Calluses for us, metabolic resistance. Think of it as developing a tolerance to alcohol, where it takes more and more of the chemical agent to do.
do whatever it is designed to do. Target site. Well, we're talking about mutations here, um, where it'll change the shape of the receptor so the chemical agent doesn't fit that receptor anymore, so it doesn't hurt the insects. Slide leaves. And this is a study on PBO, and it is interesting that they found that infants whose mothers have been exposed to low level of PBOs during their third trimester showed delayed mental development by age three. So stuff. And of course, we have the excerpt here from the MSDS from PBO, and it sounds a lot like a mutagen to me. Scary. Toxic to blood, kidneys, lung, liver, CNS. It's nothing you want to put on your breakfast cereal. <laughs> Slide, please. Oh, are they using duet? If, if they talk about, if they talk about, do they call it an adulticide? If they call it an adulticide, that's probably what they're using. Yes. Okay, let's get out of this bump trip. Slide, please. All right. One more last tidbit about cliff swallows. They are devoted parents. Both male and female feed the nestlings. The parents are very conscientious about making sure everybody gets enough to eat. But how do they tell? Slide, please. Okay, well, as it turns out, the parent bird looks into the gate of the young. They produce uh, amounts of keratins. That's what gives it the little orangey, reddy, yellowy coloration. And this is going to be a little tough to tell, but the bright one is a bird with high keratin levels. That means they need to be fed. This one with the duller color, why did that drop? Well, because the energy to produce the keratin has gone down to the digestive system, and now that's one of the telltale signs that a parent can use to feed the next chick. All right, are you ready to play along with me? Slide, please. Who's already been fed? One, two, or three? Hands? Do I have threes? Yep. All right. Who's already been fed? Two. One or two? Two. Two? Okay, let's let Mama or Papa decide. Slide, please. Slide, please. All right, who's already been fed? One or two? Two. Okay. So two has been fed. One has not been fed. Anybody, anybody got a different opinion? You say one? They look the same. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, let's let Mama or Papa decide. Slide, please. Now, as you can see, we're going to take a brief moment here. <laughs> and it's flipping me off. Huh? Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Slide, please. Who's already been fed? Any guesses? Okay. Slide, please. Who's been fed? Slide, please. Well, here's another thing. Another amazing thing that cliff swallows and other birds do, they can see ultraviolet. That means they don't rely on the visible spectrum like we do because their visible spectrum is wider than ours. And they can see what we can't, so there could be something um, in the ultraviolet spectrum that they can see to determine who needs to be fed next. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time. <laughs>